you have been at the forefront of a number of historical movements. The same is true in China. The most important of these events occurred exactly a hundred years ago in 1919. Young Chinese intellectuals sparked the anti-imperialism, anti-feudalism May 4th movement, which planted the seeds for a broader social revolution years later, led by the Communist Party of China. On Tuesday, Chinese President Xi Jinping commemorated the patriotism of those Chinese one century ago and urged today's youth to see them as a source of inspiration. So what's the legacy of the May 4th movement a hundred years later? What are the most important lessons to learn which today's youth should apply to modern China? Welcome to a special edition of The Point with me on this subject as China looks to build itself into a strong socialist country. Joining me here in the Beijing studio are Liu Zheming from Schwarzman College and the School of Journalism at Tsinghua University and uh, Katsuki Miyazaki, a Yenching Academy scholar from Peking University. Miyazaki is also engaged himself in the Asian Future Leaders Scholar Program. But before we go into the discussion, let's first take a look back at those turbulent times. 1919 would be the year that sparked China's renaissance. Thousands of students gathered at the center of Beijing's Tiananmen Square on the afternoon of May the 4th. What they were demanding was defend China's sovereignty, punish the traitors. The May 4th movement came after Beiyang government's failure in diplomacy. As one of the victorious nations of the First World War, China's legitimate demands were rejected at the Versailles Peace Conference in Paris. The peace treaty transferred German interests in China's eastern province of Shandong to Japan. When the news reached China, fury gripped students and intellectuals. My father and other students were outraged at the prospect that Chinese territory would be taken over by Japan. Soon, Chinese from all walks of life joined the movement as it spread across the country. Around two months later, Chinese representatives refused to attend the signing ceremony at Versailles, the May 4th movement had achieved its goal. But this was only the beginning of a new chapter in China's history of struggling against the imperialism and feudalism. It marked the start of China's democratic revolution. People who joined the May 4th movement were pushing for new ideas that would enable China to stand on its feet. Marxism started to be introduced and thoroughly discussed in newspapers. It gained wide public acceptance with the integration with the emerging worker forces. The emerging thoughts and experiences from the May 4th movement set the stage for the establishment of the Communist Party of China three years later. The legacy of the May 4th movement has been passed down for a hundred years, including patriotism, progressive mindset, democracy and science. We follow the spirit of the May 4th movement in our work and will pass it on to our students. In 2019, the ideas and spirit of May 4th movement continue to inspire the younger generations to work for national rejuvenation. And uh, let me welcome two representatives of youth in China and in Japan to talk about this very important subject. Um, as I mentioned, uh, President Xi Jinping gave a very important speech on the 100th anniversary of the May 4th movement in which he said that the May 4th movement was an anti-imperialism and anti-feudalism revolution and it promoted the spreading of Marxism in China, marking a turning point in contemporary Chinese history. Um, in his speech, he actually described the May 4th movement in three ways which are uh, very profound. For instance, he called it a great patriotic revolutionary movement against imperialism and feudalism, as we've learned, that uh, has been spearheaded by progressive young intellectuals and joined later by people from all walks of life, that it was a great social revolutionary movement by the Chinese people to save their nation, to safeguard their dignity and build national cohesion, and a great enlightenment and new culture movement to spread new thoughts, new culture and new knowledge. 
Mm, I want to go to Zhenming first. Mm -hmm. um, you are also actually from Shandong province, right? Yeah. Exactly the subject of the dispute there. So as a young student, what is the May 4th spirit to you? I think for nowadays, more and more people they're worrying about to, when you're a graduate from college, you're worrying about how to find a good job. But actually the things is like too small. So the, actually the May 4th spirit for me is like for those people in that generation, they think something big. They think jump out of the box and to see what's the future of our nation and what is the our generation's responsibility to facilitate the development of our country. So if only if you stand on this position level, you can like first to pursue to more than your only like individual benefit, but you think something more. Katsuki, yeah, right. your interpretation of the May Fourth Movement. I understand you're from Japan, but you spent a uh, you spent over a year in Beijing University, Peking University, I should say. Actually, many of the students uh, in that demonstration a hundred years ago came from Peking University. So, having been on that campus for a while, what has been your understanding and your observation of the May Fourth uh, spirit? Also, to be honest, I have never heard of such thing as May Fourth Spirit, as I'm not from China. But to my understanding, May Fourth Spirit seems like Chinese people's patriotism, which came from Chinese people's concern for the country's future, and then that shows Chinese people's resolution to protect the country from foreign countries. So mm -hmm. that's my understanding on mm -hmm. May 4th spirit. Mm -hmm. So patriotism is the word that you have got out of this. Uh, Jeming, what is your understanding? Because here uh, there seems to be a kind of um, confusion or debate as to what is the main message being touted by President Xi uh, in that speech. Some Western media was uh, analyzing as if President Xi was touting a nationalistic message to rally the Chinese youth around um, the, 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 the Chinese Communist Party to, um, um, uh, to safeguard the, the leadership position or the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. But we are actually, I believe, talking about a slightly different thing, which, or very much different thing, which is patriotism. What's the difference for you? I think uh, if from my per personal experiences from my undergraduate, because I joined the Communist Party when I was in grad undergraduate, and I found out uh, only if you join in the, like, into a big platform, you can get more knowledge and also open your vision, like to think about something big, just like I said, like jump out of the box. So like if you want to join the <coughs> like a communist party, um, you need to think like how to, uh, what, what kind of society is the ideal society we're pursuing to. And uh, if you put yourself on this position, it, uh, urged you to learn more, also to go to very grassroots areas to find out what exactly people are living there with their condition situation there. So only after the process of a learning and the self cultivation you will know that the Communist Party are doing something or leading the student to get more and more into the core part of China. Like uh, you live in Shanghai, Beijing, you, you will know that modern society is China. But if you go to the West part, you will know the people, they're suffering from the poverty, they're mm -hmm. suffering from the illnesses. That is also China. So if you don't like uh, um, think about this and jump out of the box, so we'll never scan this capacity of, of have a comprehensive uh, vision about uh, what the whole China is. So from this perspective, I think uh, like the Communist Party is definitely worth for the youth to learn more about and to uh, how to engage with or to like participate more with. Is that also your understanding of patriotism in this day and age when we don't have war anymore, when we don't have major uh, survival issues such as poverty, hunger? Uh, is that how you look at things? Like patriotism is more like a value orientation thing. So it depends on how responsible you are and how care you about your country. But for nationalism, it's more like a, from one nation to another nation. It's more like an international vision thing. Okay. Um, Katsuki, what is your understanding of this issue here? So in my, under, in my definition, so patriot, patriotism is mostly about pure love for your country, I think. So it's just about like normal thing that like you like your country, you love your country, 
and that's like pure love for your own country. Mm -hmm. And that uh, many countries, that's what many countries teach. But nationalism is a bit different, I think. Because as you mentioned, like nationalism is talking about nation and differentiating one nation from other nations. So nat nationalism could be problematic because uh, people see a uh, difference between nation and people. Yeah, um, in, this, in this day and age, how should you, how do you, I should say, Jiming, um, apply this kind of feeling, mm -hmm. the, the global <coughs> understanding or the comprehensive understanding of your country and the yeah. love of your country into what you do as a student uh, in, your daily, in your daily life and study? Actually, that is the biggest uh, takeaway from my uh, education from Schwarzman College as well as the School of Communication and Journalism in Chunghai University. They both put very much strong good emphasize on the social practice. So actually when I'm talking with all like students from all around the world, I know that if you want to cooperate through not only like Belt and Road Initiative, but also like a G20 and other like international organizations, the first thing is like you respect the other's benefit, like other nations benefit. But if you're like a, going to be an extreme, extreme nationalism, just like Kazuki said, like it's a it would be a little bit easier for you to secure your nation's interest uh, on the others. But actually when we're doing like international negotiation or when we are trying to really pursue for the cooperation to solve the global challenges like the global cl uh, like, uh, climate, climate change. change, yeah, climate change and financial crisis, all of this thing, you can't just put your interest to secure than the others. You need like to be mm -hmm. respectfully Okay. This kind of thing. All right, President Xi also uh, expressed six expectations for young people in the new era. He talked about, for instance, a grand vision, mm -hmm. ideal, that is based on the need of the country and the people, patriotism, which incorporates love for the country and the party, and socialism, a sense of responsibility of the times, the spirit of arduous struggle or, or endeavor, mm -hmm. and then honing abilities, meaning learning, acquiring knowledge and abilities, and, and finally, um, also uh, upholding fine morality. What do you think of these expectations on on young people there? I feel like on one side, I feel like the uh, uh, president always have a, a talk about youth, like recent years, not only from this uh, meeting, but also conference, but also other situations. They also mentioned much more stress on education for the youth. Mm -hmm. So on the one side, I think that is. Uh, uh, ask us to have a comprehensive development instead of uh, you only focusing on your major like uh, you're doing engineering you only need to learn about engineer but you also need to have the big picture right yeah so this is a uh, on the one side I feel uh, being put it a lot of uh, uh, expectation on the yeah, other side. Stressful. Pressure. Yeah, pressure. Uh, Kazuki, is that a similar thing that uh, youth in Japan are expected of, or do you find anything uh, among the six expectations that I mentioned uh, worth noting here? Um, for example, like mor morality, he mentioned, uh, Xi Jinping mentioned morality. Morality, the Improvement yeah. in morality. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, um, uh, the country develops, um, people need morality. And then Japanese people also care a lot about people's moral, like morality. But I think um, that's also the value, the like similar value we share to improve in our society mm. as the society develops. Yeah. I think that, yeah. 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 Jiming, how mm. important is morality uh, for today's young people? Because President Xi not only mentioned the six, six um, expectations, mm -hmm. he also specifically cautioned uh, young people against some wrong thought, wrongful thoughts, for instance, hedonism or, or uh, you know, a lavish lifestyle or um, some other habits or some other traits which are as associated with a, consumer, a post consumeristic society which has got, w where life has gotten so comfortable. Yeah. It, it gets so easy to relax and, and, and be complacent. What do you think of that as Like being a lifestyle, like everyone like it can choose, but it doesn't mean morality speaking, it's right. So uh, if we being very extravagant or like just like uh, what we criticized on the media recently years, like people should pay attention to, but from the root, I think that is also your vision thing. Like if you pursue to materialism, like this kind of life as the end of your life, one can easily achieve uh, their goal in this generation because we're booming our economy very fast 
and you can gain your your fortune at one night. So what what will you do after all of this? So this is what you need to think behind that. And uh, mm. for edu for advanced education, like it should give people more things like this, like value orientation thing. Maybe that's the reason why the May 4th movement is worth reflecting yeah. on, is worth yes. talking about Definitely. and stressed at this moment. Well, many thanks to Liu Zheming from Tsinghua University and Katsuki Miyazaki from Peking University. You have been watching The Point. We'll take a short break and we'll be back to talk more about the 100 years after the May 4th movement. Stay with us. The youth can do more than raise their voice. They can also join the action in his speech to commemorate 100 years since the May 4th movement. Chinese President Xi Jinping hailed the youth and their role as vanguard in national rejuvenation. To the Chinese society, that means returning the nation to a prominence in the world that it enjoyed for centuries until it became subjugated by Western gunships some 200 years ago. So what is the role of young people there? What does the May fourth spirit of patriotism, progress, democracy and science mean for young student entrepreneurs as their country stresses innovation at home and connectivity abroad. Joining me here in the second part of our special program are Zhang Yichi, founder and creative director of Flip the Script, a personal branding consultancy based in Beijing, and Moaz Awan, managing director of Global Silk Route Enterprises, which introduces Pakistani handicrafts and tourism to the Chinese Chinese market gentlemen, welcome to the point. Um, each, let me go to you first. I want to mention a little bit about President Xi talked about uh, in his speech to commemorate the 100 years of the May 4th movement. He particularly talked about a lack of fundo uh, jingshen. Um, in, in English, the, the best I can find is the lack of the spirit to, to fight for a cause that you believe in, to, to persevere and endure the difficulties but continue to fight until you reach your goal um, despite all of the difficulties. During the revolutionary years, during the early years of the uh, Chinese, of the People's Republic of China, this spirit was very much alive, but it seems that as our life gets better, as our living standard gets higher, it seems that the young generations today do not have this kind of spirit or are in the danger of losing it. Is that how you feel? Um, do you think that is an important aspect to stress so that Chinese, the Chinese nation, the Chinese people can continue striving for goals further uh, along the line? Uh, yes, I, I, I believe um, first, I believe that that is extremely important for the young leaders, young uh, professionals to, to work hard and ha fight for the cause. And I, I do believe that in my generation, the people that I'm around with, um, they are fighting for the cause. They are um, innovative. They work extremely hard. Um, it just depends on which type of youth we're talking about. Hmm. I believe that um, our education system and um, the the working environment it's that that is also part of this whole movement in the future because when I I, I interview a lot of uh, young college students from interviewing with them I see I see the fire I see the creativity from mm -hmm. their mind but I just think that um, they haven't given the ch they haven't been given the chance to really um, express to demonstrate what they are capable of. I believe the, the shift or the upgrade of our education system and also the whole working environment will boost this spirit of fighting for cause in China's future. So you think that the fire is there, the passion is there, it's just that they haven't been able to find um, or that the channel is not there for them to express that kind of, to, to put their spirit of fighting into practice. I, I certainly believe so. Mm. Um, just one quick little, ex uh, very simple example. Uh, one of the, the guys working for us right now, he's, he does video, he does editing, but his major in college was accounting mm. because he wasn't able to find the right major for him. But um, he, he fell in love with the skateboarding, he fell in love with sports. He started to learn how to shoot and cut the videos mm. when he was a freshman. Now he's about to graduate. 
And his ability, his creativity is just firing the wall. Hmm. It's amazing. What does that have to do with the May 4th movement? I mean, you agreed to come, and come to the show and talk right. about it. Do you see a connection, a slight connection between what happened 100 years ago, what propelled those young students 100 years ago with the kind of fire that are propelling the student example that you mentioned to do something completely different? Uh, I, I see the parallel there is that the world is changing, right, with the, the, the rising of the mobile internet, uh, this whole environment and uh, the ecosystem, the young, the young, the young professionals are giving more opportunities to express, mm -hmm. to show what they are capable of, and we have already seen that on on Kuaizhou, on Douyin, on the Chinese social media, and they are they are passing the the, the positive energy. They are showing uh, how creativity can bring not only. I can how, create, how creativity can not only helping them to make a career, but also to show the value, the right value to society, mm -hmm. and then to encourage more young adults like that. Yeah, Alwan, uh, you are from Pakistan. How long have you been in China, and uh, how much have you observed that uh, resonate with the messages that you took away from President Xi's speech? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I've been uh, living in China for almost like eight years. And uh, I was one of the most earliest people coming to China when when coming to China was not in fashion. From Pakistan. From Pakistan. Uh, right now, it's it's definitely in fashion, and every year more and more people are coming to mm. China. And What's your yeah, please. And um, uh, from the message which I which I get uh, from President Xi's um, you know speech on on the May Day is that uh, young people really need to come out to change the situation of their countries. So the message which I would get is uh, with Pakistan, we have, uh, of course, the whole world knows that we have economic crisis. And I think that the Pakistani youth are really eager to um, start their businesses, start economic activity, so that the country can really progress in a way that you know, makes uh, Pakistan a very stable uh, economic uh, you know, power. Mm. Do you feel the kind of space um, that's big enough for young people to, to empower themselves, uh, therefore to empower the Chinese economy in China? Well, definitely. Uh, I came to China in very interesting times. I would uh, definitely say that. Uh, while I was in college and uh, mostly when I just had classes, I observed that the Chinese entrepreneurship uh, um, conditions were really changing. Uh, well, I saw in front of my eyes uh, college companies becoming multinational conglomerates. Mm. Uh, for example, let's take Ulama, uh, you take uh, bike sharing apps. These all come from college and young people have the power to adapt to diversity, to mobile, to internet. Yeah. And that's why, you know, that's the key. They are the, they are the tomorrow's leaders. Uh, each, uh, um, in President Xi's speech, he actually talked about uh, some um, space that the, the party, the government and the elder generation need to leave for the young people, which I think is quite worth noting. He said that uh, it is important to provide guidance to young people in terms of uh, the confusion and dilemma they might face at crossroads in life, allow them to make mistakes and tolerate whenever possible and give them more time and space for growth instead of blaming them too harshly. He also talked about uh, uh, the need for young people and elder generation to learn from each other and to help each other. Um, are you feeling that in, in your life and in, in your endeavor to start your own business here? Oh yes, I, I, I feel that every week um, because my, my parents, they're also, they're also entrepreneurs. They have small business in, in the third year city in China. And um, when I first came back to China from the U.S., um, my father and I, we argued all the time because he thought his method, his ideas, his way of doing things is just the way to do so. But after three years, we've been discussing, having argument, but we have come to a common ground where I listened to him, he shared his experience with me, but also he's willing to listen and then listen to the, the, the new ideas to try to, even if that's, that's 
even if that fails, it's okay. Yeah, well, yeah. with father, within the family, I guess it's relatively yeah. easier. But if, you're, if you have difficulties and you need to go and talk to the city government, right. or you need to go to talk to the, the district government, is it so easy as well? Will you, lis will they, will oh, you listen man, to Oh, man, that, that's a great question because I never knew that there were so many resources when, I'm, when I moved back to Beijing. And I learned there is the, uh, in the Chaoyang Overseas Talent uh, Center that they help to facilitate uh, to support the entrepreneurs, not only Chinese entrepreneurs, but also foreigners working in Beijing. Uh, the resources and the supports have been just amazing in my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of connectivity, because President Xi also talked about uh, promoting the idea of building a uh, community of shared future for humankind, and uh, Chinese youth definitely has a role to play there. But Awan, uh, coming from your perspective, uh, uh, how do you look at the kind of opportunities and uh, the kind of uh, um, challenges maybe also in building that connectivity? For the, for the youth generation? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that President, I think personally that President Xi is a visionary leader. Uh, while the whole world is engaged in ruthless uh, geopolitics, uh, you can see what's happening in Venezuela and all around the world. Uh, here comes a leader from the East who is talking about win-win cooperation, betterment, development, and you know, cooperation and mutual trust. So I think I, I, really, I, I really am a personal fan of this. And um, going over to connectivity, Pakistan is one of the first uh, countries to join uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, we are in the second phase of constructing the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. That is almost going to end, and we're now closing on to the, entering the third part. In terms of youth connectivity? In terms of youth connectivity, um, I personally think that there has to be uh, there, there still has a lot of uh, potential and, it's a, and mm -hmm. a lot of vacuum present in uh, terms of youth connectivity. For example, um, okay. some of the programs which are currently underway are uh, there are 28,000 uh, Pakistani students studying in, in China and this year there is going, going to be a drastic increase uh, in the number of Pakistani students coming here. Yeah. There are four uh, Confucius Institutes in Pakistan, 21 Chinese study centers and a dozen other Chinese culture exchange programs in, in, in Pakistan. Okay, so we're going to leave it there, but I think uh, the takeaway from this edition would probably be that patriotism, progress, uh, democracy and science is uh, not just for youth in China, uh, hopefully that they can be the spirit that benefit uh, students in countries that are along the Belt and Road in other parts of the world so that uh, there can really be a greater shared future for everybody. I have to leave it there. Many thanks to Zhang Yi Chu, who is uh, creative founder and creative director of Flip the Script and uh, Moaz Awa, managing director of Global Silk Route Enterprises. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin. This has been a special edition on the 100 years after the May 4th movement. As usual, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.